since I did talk about Planet X last year, and there has been some, some changes in the story, I'm going to give a very brief update on Planet X. After that, I'm going to talk about the harmonic concordance, for those of you that can, that can remember pseudoscience from as far back as three months ago. And these things do tend to go away pretty quickly. I'm going to talk about some, some um, pseudoscience about Jupiter. And I chose this title carefully, um, not because it's just a dumb joke, but because it's actually applicable. And um, finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about Mars and what's going on with that. That's the best pun I could think of. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, there you go. Update on Planet X. Those of you remember last year, I was talking about Planet X, this giant planet that some people say sweeps by the Earth every 3,600 years and causes earthquakes and uh, pole shift and all sorts of disaster and all kinds of things. Um, and I claimed last year that there's no astronomical evidence for it. There's astronomical evidence that it, it's not there. And since that time, there have been big changes. The biggest one is that it still doesn't exist. <laughs> so, you know, moving on. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. And that, that in, in fact, I could actually give a whole talk about what has happened since last year about Planet X. But in the end, you know, it doesn't exist. And nothing has changed. Not, not one of my arguments has changed. Nothing I said last year at TAM1 has changed. And so what I would urge you to do is go and buy the DVD that has my talk on it. And that way, you can find out about Planet X and you can help Randy. Or you can go to my website for free. So that's up to you. But the Planet X, <clears throat> heck with it. So the harmonic concordance, do people remember what this was all about last year? You call yourself skeptics, not one hand goes, well, Scott's hand goes up. Okay, there we go. Yeah, the little audience participation. You know, this isn't how you can actually stay awake during this talk. <laughs> the harmonic concord uh, concordance was an interesting astrological event. Now, I don't have much about astrology on my website because I was just talking to, uh, to Leah McDade about this, actually, just a couple of minutes ago. When people ask you, you know, what do you know about astrology? And you say, well, I know it's wrong and, and all this stuff. There is so much literature about astrology, it's really hard to debunk it. Because if I say, well, you know, the sun was in Ophiuchus when I was born, and, or Scorpius, and not Libra, but I'm called a Libra. They say, oh, well, that's just tropical sun sign astronomy. We've got, you know, Vedic blah, blah, blah astro astrology that, that, that does this and that. It's, uh, so there's no, way, there's no way to combat this stuff on that sort of specific level. So I tend to shy away from astrology a little bit and just say, you know, it just doesn't work and, and there are some bigger reasons for it. But there are occasions when astrology becomes very specific and the harmonic concordance was one of these. This is a, a merging of, of, old, of old style astrology with some new age claptrap stuff. And a friend of mine says new age is actually, you're supposed to pronounce it as if it rhymes with sewage. So it's actually newage. Um, and I, I will sometimes call it that. So it's, it's some newage nonsense. And, and basically there's a website that came out. It was harmonicconcordance, I believe, dot com that talks about this, this event. Basically what it is, it is six objects, six celestial objects that are aligned in the sky in a perfect hexagram pattern. Now we've heard about these events before. There was the uh, alignment of the planets in May of 2000, which did not destroy the Earth, despite claims. Before that, there was, in 1982, there was the Jupiter effect, and Jupiter, you know, and, and the, the, the totally misnamed Jupiter effect, for those of you that have read this book, it was called the Jupiter effect because they were saying that the, the gravity of Jupiter affects the sun, and the sun affects the Earth, and there was gonna be earthquakes and all this stuff. But in fact, in the book, they claim it's Mercury that has the most effect on the sun. The book was a little confused. Of course, the book predicted that in 1982, Los Angeles would be destroyed by a giant earthquake, which is unusual in pseudoscience. They usually don't make such specific predictions. And when Los Angeles was not destroyed in an earthquake in 1982, they published a second book called Beyond the Jupiter Effect, which is saying, oh, did we say 1982? Right? So anyway, the harmonic concordance, we hear about these alignment of the planets all the time. But th this, was actually, this was actually pretty interesting. I didn't hear about it until almost right before the event. I had to scramble to write up a web page about it. But I was reading this web page, and uh, it, it's the, uh, the science of ascension you know, rising up. And it's like, well, there's a little science in there, a little gravity and force, but that's about it. But I love it. It says, welcome to the science portal here at the home site of the Harmonic Concordance. And he goes on and on about science. And as I was reading this, and this is the main web page for the Harmonic Concordance. There are millions of these pages, but this is the big one. As I was reading this, I got down to a part near the bottom, which I will highlight here for you, and I'll read this. Proponents of this philosophy, and they're talking about the scientific method here. Proponents of this philosophy assume that knowledge can come only from logical reasoning or empirical experience. <laughs> what the hell were we thinking? I mean, once you throw away the logical reasoning and the empirical experience, you have sort of boiled things down to their essence in the, in the homeopathic 200C type ways. As Bob was talking about earlier. 
And I think, you know, I think in a sense, all of pseudoscience is homeopathic because the less actual content they have, the more they seem to be popular. So I think that's that homeopathic pseudoscience might actually be a, might actually be a good website. So what happened with this harmonic concordance? Well, last November, uh, on the evening of the 8th here in, in America, it was actually the, the morning of the 9th east of us because it, it happened uh, 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 sort of near midnight at Greenwich time. Six astronomical objects in the sky aligned and there was a total lunar eclipse, okay? This made it very special to the astrologers. And this is, in fact, true. This did happen. Here is the astrological chart that is on the Harmonic Concordance site. As I said, I, the titles of these pages can be a little painful, but uh, they're fun. So this is the astrological chart that this guy has cast about the Harmonic Concordance. He talks about casting it for your own locations and all these things, and I'm trying to figure out why being on a slightly different spot on the Earth is going to change the positions of objects which are billions of miles away. But, but uh, you know, it's, they're astrologers. They don't understand numbers so well. And it was interesting. I was looking at this chart, and basically it's, it's Earth-centered. It's if you're, you're at the center of this and you're looking out on the sky. And what you see are the symbols for Mercury here, the Moon, I believe that is Saturn, Jupiter, the Sun, and then this object, well, here's Mars, and this object, which is labeled K. It's not potassium. It's not special K. <laughs> and I thought, K, it's a purple K. What is K? And then if you look at this chart here, right here, K, this really surprised me, is C-H-I-R. It's, 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 it's Chiron, K for Chiron. I mean, it's, it's Greek pronunciation, so it's a K sound. And I thought, Chiron, Chiron. Well, what is Chiron? Chiron is an, is an astronomical object. It's, it's, a, it's called a centaur. It's, a, it's a sort of a, a giant icy body. It's bigger than a comet, smaller than, much smaller than a planet. Some, there, there's a the group of these objects. Chiron is actually the first one that was discovered in the 1970s. They are all roughly 100 miles across. There aren't any that get too much bigger than that. They're very icy. They have some rock in them. They're, they're, they're much like comets. They are just basically a big comet. They exist between the orbits of Jupiter and Neptune, more or less. They are possibly objects which were orbiting the sun farther out and were brought in through gravitational interactions with Uranus and Neptune. And so when these things are orbiting the sun way out there and Neptune passes by, it tugs on it a little bit. And over millions and billions of years, the orbit changes and it, it can draw these things in. There aren't that many known. Oh, and, and, and I'm sorry, that, that region of space is called the Kuiper Belt. And so that's why I say it's a Kuiper Belt escapee. So it, it's, it, this thing has been brought in. You can see an animation of it here moving a little bit amongst the stars. And you can see that it's an extremely faint object. Here's a picture of it taken that shows a little to any bit of fuzziness around it. That's how they know it's an icy object. Certain times of the year, it actually can melt a little bit and the, and the gases escape, and it becomes more like a comet, but not like one of these giant comets that comes through the sky. It just has a little bit of this stuff. But what I found interesting is that um, on, on November 9th, during the harmonic concordance, the brightness of this thing was roughly magnitude 18. Okay, now the magnitude scale is a brightness scale in astronomy. It's a logarithmic scale. Basically, every six numbers is a factor of 100. So the faintest object you can see with your eye is very roughly magnitude 6. So a magnitude 12 object would be a hundredth as bright as magnitude 6, and a magnitude 18 object would be a hundredth as bright as that. So in fact, Chiron is one ten thousandth as bright as the faintest star you can see with the naked eye. Okay? One ten thousandth as bright as the faintest star you can see with the naked eye. Okay, just making sure you heard that. All right? Eighteenth magnitude, 200 kilometer object, what is this doing on an astrological chart with the sun? Okay. We need to find something that's not going to dwarf Chiron. I know. The biggest, brightest object in the solar system. The sun is like billions of times brighter than this dinky thing. and It's a lot closer, too. So what is this thing doing on the chart? Well, it has to be on the chart. Because if it's not on the chart, you don't have a harmonic concordance. Okay. So this is putting the cart before the horse. This is interesting because on this chart that I was, I was looking up on the table, I actually looked these numbers up. I, I went to a, an astronomical piece of software that will tell you these things. And basically what you do is you plot the positions of these objects on the sky. So if I declare that the sun is just zero degrees, I'm just going to call it zero. Okay, and if I go 60 degrees this way in the sky, I get to the moon. Or excuse me, 180 degrees around the sky. Hop, uh, completely opposite the sun in the sky. 180 degrees is the moon. So if, it, if this were a perfect alignment, the moon would be at 180 degrees away from the sun. And it was, in fact, at 179.5 degrees. 